Of coming for the, to this next in series of short talks of Dorset Humanists. Um, tonight we're talking about religion, and it's the it's religion for non-believers, and whether how we should make sense of religion, and um, and, and potentially make use of it. So um, so I've got uh, two talkers tonight. I, I think they're both going to give the positive side of the case for religion and how non-believers might make use of it. Um, I've also invited two of my friends from Parkson who have, uh, go to the local Catholic church and they can check out whether um, there's any sense or use for humanists and maybe report to us later on. Um, I am first going to introduce David and tell you who he is, but I think you know who he is. <laughs> not, not everyone knows necessarily. <laughs> they may have seen is me it? on television. <laughs> David, not David, David is the chair of Dorset Humanists and, uh, and he's going to talk about Don Cupid. Um, he was doing a theology degree in Kent in 1980 at about the same time as Don Cupid wrote his book, Taking Leave of God. and. Um, we're going to find out what the effect of that was. And then uh, after about another 45 minutes, I'll introduce Margaret, um, who is a long-standing member of Dorset Humanist, but we don't see her very much because of her intensive grandparenting duties on the days that we, we have most of our meetings. But she's going to talk about Alain de Botton and his book, um, Religion for Atheists. So I'll hand over straight away to David. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> a light applause to start with is always encouraging. Uh, thanks very much. For... Well, Don Cupid was born in 1934 in Lancashire, and uh, in the 1950s he went as a student to Trinity Hall in Cambridge to study science. And Phil, I think you went to Trinity Hall. I didn't know that. Oh, yes, to study yeah. science. Exactly. I just found that out this week. Yeah. Did he actually? Okay studied at Trinity Hall, um, but <coughs> so often happens with uh, students, particularly in the 50s, the Christian Union got their hands into That's him so and within a few weeks he'd been converted to Christianity or become a Christian. Um, so he switched from science to theology and philosophy and in 1960 he was ordained as a, an Anglican priest. Uh, after a few years as a curate in the north of England, he uh, went back to Cambridge and started lecturing in philosophy of religion at uh, Emmanuel College in Cambridge, where he stayed for the next 30 years, and he's now a life fellow of Emmanuel College, and uh, he's still effectively based there. If you ever want to contact him, you can write to him there, and uh, he does reply uh, within a few days. And um, but, but now, as you probably calculated, he's in his early 80s. Well, Don Cupid has written more than 40 books. Um, I did toy with the idea of bringing them all along to show you, um, but I, I haven't done that. I wasn't sure where I'd put them. Um, I have read most of them, not in the last week. I did sort of flip through about 10 of them uh, in preparation for this talk. Well, in 1977, uh, Don Cupid contributed a chapter to this book. Um, if you've been knocking around for quite a few years, you may remember this book, The Myth of God Incarnate, caused a little bit of a storm in the 1970s. This is in the days when newspapers actually took notice of what theologians were saying, <laughs> and uh, a book like that, The Myth of God Incarnate, actually casting doubt on the divinity of Jesus, um, was actually newsworthy. I suppose the last time theology was really newsworthy was uh, the Bishop of Durham in the 80s, you know, casting doubt on the resurrection and the virgin birth. But anyway, that book caused a bit of a storm in 1977, and Don Cupid was one of the contributors. Then in 1980, he wrote a book called Taking Leave of God, and in this book he argued that the old kind of religion that he'd grown up with and, and sort of committed himself to as an Anglican priest, uh, as a so the old kind of religion as a system of social control uh, has been swept away by history uh, as far as he was concerned and he argued that God himself should now be understood <coughs> as mythical and as a kind of personification of spiritual or ethical values such as compassion. 
And this book was really a tipping point for me as a student of theology at the University of uh, Kent in Canterbury. I actually went to Darwin College, which is nice to remember that I went to Darwin College there. And I heard Don Cupid uh, lecture there in about 1980. I spoke to him briefly after the lecture. That's the only time I've actually spoken to him, but have exchanged a few letters over the years with him. Or oh, he kindly, he very kindly replies to my letters to him. And um, I think, well, some of you know I went in to study theology as an evangelical Christian, and then at, at university I was exposed to liberal and radical theology, and so I was reappraising what I believed. And when this book came along, um, particularly after reading Honest to God, which you may remember from the 1960s, was published by the Bishop of uh, Woolwich, John Robinson, this was kind of the next um, big thing in theology. And when I read this, I was still a sort of evangelical Christian, but um, by 1982, I, I did actually think, yeah, I, I agree with Don Cupid, and I, I became... Uh, I, I, suppose I, I said I became an atheist, although Don Cupid didn't call it atheism because he wanted to maintain this idea that the word God was, still had some meaning, um, albeit mythical and as a personification of values. Uh, so he didn't like the word atheism, he, he, he used to talk about non-realism instead. Anyway, very um, important book in my own um, sort of journey from faith to atheism and then humanism. In 1984, Don Cupid wrote this book, The Sea of Faith, which also became a television <coughs> series, and it traced the retreat of religious belief over the last 200 years. The image of the Sea of Faith is from a poem by Matthew Arnold in the 19th century, this idea of the sea uh, just going down a beach, the tide going out and actually not coming back again, and that was the Sea of Faith going out and not coming back. And this book inspired the Sea of Faith Network, um, which is still, um, still up and running, uh, you may have heard of it. And the purpose of that network is to promote Don Cupid's idea that religion can still be meaningful, even if uh, God is considered to be mythical. So we're going to explore that in this short talk. But let's have a look at definitions of the word religion, because uh, otherwise we're not going to get very far. If we're still stuck with this... Um, primary belief, uh, this primary definition of religion, um, belief in worship of God or gods, if you look in the dictionary that's the first definition you'll see. Uh, you may also see a definition like this, an all-conceiving passion like football, uh, that was in the Concise Oxford Dictionary. Uh, I didn't find this third definition, um, which uh, I think Christine might uh, might appeal to you, Christine, a practice or an applied philosophy that delivers enlightenment and bliss. So uh, Buddhism, I think, would clearly fall into that category if we want to call Buddhism a religion. So um, Don Cupid's view on this, uh, which he expressed in a book called Philosophy's Own Religion, he said this, Westerners have such a strong propensity to equate religion with supernatural beliefs they find it hard to accept that beliefless religion can be interesting or even that it makes any sense. So that may be your position here this evening and maybe within the next 10 minutes I might persuade you to modify your view slightly on that. But if not, we can discuss it. Um, okay, in 1998 he wrote this book, The Religion of Being, which was a book about the philosophy of Martin Heidegger. And uh, this book argued that traditional religion was designed to shield human beings from the human situation. So in a nutshell, we're alone in a meaningless universe. And, and traditional religion had kind of protected people for thousands of years from this horrifying thought. Um, but Don Cupid is saying that traditional religion is in terminal decline, and yet we still face the same existential situation. So Don Cupid is saying we need a new religion to help us. So a year later he wrote this book called The New Religion of Life in Everyday Speech. When I, when I first saw that book I thought it was going to be Don Cupid in plain English, but that's not actually what he meant. Still wasn't in plain English. Um, in this book Cupid argued that a new religion of life, I'm putting that in inverted commas, um, has already established itself in everyday speech. 
And the evidence for this, according to Cupid, uh, is the way in which phrases about life crop up in everyday speech. And we're going to have a look at some of those in a moment. He claims that ordinary people are now devoted not to God, but to life. And he also calls this religious humanism. Uh, he also calls it a, an applied philosophy of life. So if you really don't like the word religion, you can take your pick from some alternative ways of describing it. In 2006, he wrote this book, The Old Creed and the New, and this, I found, was one of Cupid's clearest comparisons between traditional Christianity and his, what he's describing as this new religion of life. So let's have a look at the old creed and the new, and we'll just do some comparisons between the two, just to make it a little bit clearer what we're talking about here. So in the old creed, we're talking about tra traditional Christianity here, or, um, or Islam, if you, if you like. Um, so Christians had to, or expected to love God with all your heart and soul. And um, <coughs> Jesus said, hate your life in this world. Keep it for eternal life. That's John 12, 25, if you want the reference. Um, Osama bin Laden, we are lovers of death. Uh, and in traditional religion, a funeral is a rite of passage to life after death. And when people use that word, someone has passed, I'm afraid I, I don't like that word. I just would prefer it if people said, you know, someone has died. Because past kind of, to me, means some of their going somewhere else. So the new creed, um, according to Cupid, um, we believe in life before death. Uh, love life with the same religious intensity with which people used to love God. I put religious intensity in inverted commas in case you're questioning that. Um, live life to the full, take life as it comes, find your mission in life. Carpe diem, a popular tattoo. I'm not going to inspect all of you, but some of you may have that tattooed on yourself somewhere. <laughs> I know at least two people in here. Um, and funerals now are a celebration of someone's life, rather than the idea of uh, them going somewhere else. Let's look at... Uh, Cupid has collected 250 uh, of what he calls life idioms. Let's just have a look at... Uh, um, a dozen or so of them. I'm sure you know where that, that one comes from. <laughs> uh, the good things in life. That's life. Well, yeah, Esther Ranson television program in the 70s or 80s. Uh, this is the life. Such is life. Get a life. Um, the time of your life. The story of my life. We like to have a sort of narrative of our lives. Uh, really living. Feeling more alive. Live your own life. It's my life. Those two there, um, very much encapsulating the idea of taking ownership of, the, of your own life. Um, I did it my way, it might, might come to mind as well. Life is what you make it. Uh, Nietzsche said live dangerously, but then if you live fast you might die young. Um, don't let life pass you by. You only live once, or maybe twice, if you're a James Bond fan. Um, quality of life we talk about, and if someone's quality of life goes beneath a, a certain threshold, we might, we might say that perhaps their life is not worth living. Life's a bitch. Sorry about the sexist language there, but I couldn't resist just including that one. Which, and the next one coming up is even worse, from Samuel Beckett, um, uh, which is, uh, appears in one of his plays. Cupid calls that particular phrase the ultimate blasphemy in the religion of life. Um, I don't know if you've heard this, if you have any Jewish friends, when they, when they have a drink, they might say, L'chaim. And it's only recently I found out that that means to life, which is a great salutation. Nietzsche again, say yes to life, and that phrase cropped up a lot in Don Cupid's writings. Uh, just do it. Okay, well, you know, the, the word life doesn't appear in that phrase, but I think it kind of ties in with this, uh, a Nike slogan. And it does appear in Cupid's writings. Again, although he doesn't, uh, he doesn't um, actually say it belongs to Nike. Um, I love that one, see Naples and die. That's not that I've been to Naples, well, I have actually been to Naples and Florida, which are quite nice. Um, but this idea that you can, you can have an experience that is so overwhelmingly fantastic that you then say, I'm ready to die. 
And I remember um, several years ago, before my mum died, she was with all of her children and she was feeling really happy and she said, do you know what? I could die now and I could die happy. Now this is extraordinary, that all the way back in 1960, from War and Peace, now Tol remember that Tolstoy was a Christian writer, um, and yet he made one of his characters in War and Peace say this, life is everything, life is God. Let's see also how religious terminology has been transferred to everyday speech. Um, we might talk about miracle of life, sanctity of life, the life and soul of the party the human spirit. You might talk about a place that's really special to you as, as a sacred place. Um, you, might, you might love somebody so much you talk about worshipping them. Uh, we talk about rock gods. Uh, roadside shrines are, are the kind of things that have um, cropped up in recent years. We talk about gratitude, perhaps as an alternative to saying thanks to God. Uh, we might describe things as heavenly, divine, or angelic, or hellish, or demonic. We might talk about something as being a revelation or an epiphany. And I couldn't resist this next one, which you'll see if you're on social media. <laughs> Cupid talks about some prophets of the religion of life. Tolstoy perhaps is one, but he also mentions Thoreau, uh, Nietzsche, Van Gogh, uh, Proust. D.H. Lawrence and Virginia Woolf. So we'll just briefly uh, have a look at some of those. Thoreau first. <clears throat> this, uh, this next um, quotation I'm going to put up, I'm sure it, it must have appeared on an, an Athena poster in the 1970s. Some of you will remember that. And this made a particular impression on me at the time. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and to see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. So he wrote that in 1854 in his book Walden, and it was that phrase in the middle there, um, when I came to die, I didn't, don't want to get to that situation, you know, at the moment of death, think, actually, I haven't lived. Um, so that made a deep impression on me as a young man. D.H. Lawrence next. Look at the passages on the right, um, Bible passages. Seek the Lord while he may be found from Isaiah. Seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And then D.H. Lawrence in The Plumed Serpent in 1926 deliberately changes those. Seek life where it may be found. Seek life first. So Keeper is saying that Lawrence was a prophet of his, this so-called religion of life. Virginia Woolf next. Uh, Mrs. Dalloway, again from the 1920s. Uh, this is a delicious sentence in, in her book, Mrs. Dalloway. Life itself, every moment of it, every drop of it, here, this instant, now, in the sun, in Regent's Park, was enough. And I know that some of you may have that experience when you go to Studland as well, a sort of paradise <laughs> yes. of uh, sunshine and um, a sort of fantastic sort of moment in the sun. Um, Marcel Proust, um, Cupid claims that Marcel Proust is also a prophet of the religion of life. Um, well, you can read his original novel, In Search of Lost Time, if you have the time to read it. It's just over 3,000 pages. Uh, or you could read Alain de Botton's book, How Proust Can Change Your Life, which is only 200 pages. And you can buy it for one penny on Amazon. Okay. Nice little link there to uh, Alain de Botton for your mark. <laughs> um, Cupid also makes a distinction between religious uh, art and secular art. Now, um, this, is this is a particularly horrible example of religious art, but I have this feeling that European art galleries are stuffed full of paintings like this, where the figures are not really very real, they're not very lifelike, they're, they're sort of wax figures, static and lifeless. And I can't stand art like that. Um, and Cupid, um, he um, 
makes a comparison between art like that and art like this, which is uh, Place Saint Lazare by Cam Camille Pizarro in 1893, where Pizarro is, is trying to paint real life. And I want you to just try and imagine that street scene coming to life. You know, all of those carriages buzzing around and people chatting and gossiping and shopping. And this um, amazing um, teemingness of life there in that painting. And I'd much rather look at paintings that are just painting real life like that. Cupid also says that we should live the way Van Gogh paints. And he says that we should live like an expressionist. So Van Gogh was a so-called expressionist painter as an outpouring of our life energies. And so this is a particularly um, good example of a painting by Van Gogh that links in with what uh, Cupid is saying. This is the Sower, uh, 1888. And Cupid um, says in many of his books, we should live like the sun, just pouring ourselves out into life and passing away at the same time. He also uses the image of a fountain, again, this kind of outpouring of, of life and energy and immediately passing away at the same time. So how can the religion of life help us with aspects of the human situation? Uh, I haven't got much time left, but I'm going to very briefly go through um, anxiety about ageing, time slipping away, uh, horror of approaching death and oblivion, the problem of evil, good and bad fortune, what's it all about anyway, a sense of pointlessness, and lastly, wow. sex and sexuality. So can the religion of life help us with uh, ageing and time slipping away? Well, traditional religion sees life as a journey or a pilgrimage, life as a preparation for life after death, and God lives outside of time. So that traditional religion solves the problem of time in that way. The religion of life is quite different. It, it says that we should live on the edge, serve the present moment, accept the transience of life, we have one life, this is it. This moment here now in Friends Meeting House is it. Um, and life's a theatre where we put on a good show. Horror about approaching death or oblivion. In traditional religion, well, lots of people will pray for me, God will look after me, and if, all, if the worst comes to the worst, death is a passage into eternal life. In the religion of life, uh, this is going all the way back to Epicurus. Death is nothing to us, so forget about death. Burn brightly like the sun until you are burnt out. Put on a good show right to the end. And if you forget self and love life, uh, the, 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 the uh, confident expectation is that this will help you conquer a fear of death. Problem of evil. In traditional religion, goodness and justice will ultimately triumph. God will defeat Satan and Jesus will come again on the clouds. But in the religion of life, life is a package deal. It contains everything. Good and evil, comedy and tragedy, bliss and wretchedness. And this phrase crops up a lot in Cupid's writings. Life is bittersweet. Sometimes he changes that to bitter, bittersweet. Um, and he says that life goes on after every atrocity. Haven't we seen that recently with terrorist outrages and the fire at Grenfell Tower? Life just carries on. People just pick themselves up and keep going. Good and bad fortune. You've heard people say, why me? What have I done wrong? Well, the answer in traditional religion is that God has got a plan for your life. Everything will turn out okay in the end. But in the religion of life, we have to accept that life itself is completely indifferent. So give up complaining, renounce any victim psychology, let go of any resentments and regrets. And how popular that phrase has become, <laughs> the kind of stoic phrase, keep calm and carry on. I've got a mug of that on somewhere. What's it all about anyway? A sense of pointlessness sometimes overcomes people. In traditional religion, don't worry about it. God has got a plan for your life and the ultimate meaning of it all will be revealed. In the religion of life, we're, we are asked to forget all about the, the meaning of life, but inject meaning into your life by the way you live it. 
and your life probably won't get nicely rounded off unless somebody writes a beautiful biography of you, um, but make your own unique contribution to life. Sex and sexuality in traditional religion, it's a necessary evil and it has to be strictly controlled within monogamous opposite marriage, opposite sex marriage, or even better, celibacy. But in the religion of life, we expect to have a sex life and sexual fulfilment to explore our sexuality, to come out, and another little link there to Alan de Botton, who's written a book called How to Think More About Sex. <laughs> if you're not thinking about it enough, read that book. <laughs> okay, a quick recap, and then we're into the final stroke. You'll be pleased to know, Phil. Um, so, Cupid is saying that traditional religion can consoled us, but it's internal collapse. But we're still the same human beings with the same existential situation facing oblivion. So according to Cupid, we need, and we've already adopted what he's calling a new religion of life. So how should we live? Last few slides coming up. He says we sh one should hope to go up like a rocket and burn out at the summit of one's flight, falling unnoticed to earth in the darkness. Give it your best shot. Make the best you can of your life and enrich your corner of the world. Cupid is particularly fond of insects, and he says that we should live as if at the end of the world with the furious joy of those insects that have only one or two days to emerge, dry out their wings, sip a little nectar, find a mate, copulate energetically, <laughs> lay their eggs and die. One has work to do and one must do it in a hurry with furious joy. So he says we should not waste the only life we will ever have. We should seek to live as generously and affirmatively as possible. We should commit ourselves to living this life to the full while we have it. Life's a package deal. It can't be renegotiated and there's no alternative. So we should buy into it and make the very most of it. Thank you very much. If you want any uh, reading um, suggestions, The Way to Happiness is probably the most accessible one. Um, that's quite an interesting one as well, the old creed and the new. And uh, if you're comfortable reading theology and philosophy, you might find those two interesting as well, The Fountain and The Last Testament. But uh, Phil, have we got time for some questions? Yes, now? certainly yeah. we have, and, uh, and you kept bang on your... Almost, almost, yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy. I was disappointed to stop it, really. It was very enjoyable. So, questions from anybody? Phil? And any objections as well? You know, if you think this is complete rubbish, that's fine. You can say, no, I, I really enjoyed it. It was very good. But I thought it was very individualistic. It's a sort yes. of, and, and to me, it missed out the essentials of religion, which I think are community building um, and, um, and the ritualistic nature of religion. Mm -hmm. So those are two elements I think we're missing from perhaps the, uh, the definition, but the most important of it I think is, uh, is the one about community mm -hmm. um, and shared, um, shared experience of life. Yes. Rather than, you know, I thought that was very good, but it was very, very highly individualistic. Yes. I think maybe we'll get more on that, those topics in Margaret's yeah, uh, so. on yeah. area. But I, I think that's a very interesting comment, Phil, because my impression of Don Cupid, I mean, he went, he went through absolute hell with the church, you know, coming out with all of this stuff in the 80s and 90s particularly. And he thought that, he, that the Church of England might be persuaded to sort of go his way. Well, of course, they've gone in the opposite direction. So eventually he, he left the church and he doesn't practice as a priest anymore. He doesn't call himself a, a Christian. Uh, he's more comfortable with Buddhism and, and with uh, what he calls radical humanism. And I do get the sense that he's, I don't know if he's a lonely character, but you do get the sense that he's, you know, he's, he's writing his books very much as an individualist. And you do get that sense that it's not a, it's not a project that he's working on with anyone else. Um, but I know you're making another point about religion and the, the sort of corporate well, element. Well, no, of it, it's all tied up. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's yeah, really yeah. right. Yeah. Um, I think also a bit about sort of um, rules and morals and ethics and and um, the kind of way to live 
a life, which I'm pretty sure Anne de Botan talks about, but so I won't um, yeah. Okay, that. okay. Yeah, the number of people. But yeah, Christine. I just wanted to say um, that your phrase, beliefless religion, mm. to me, a religion has beliefs. And yes. it has beliefs which are imposed on you as a, a believer and which you have to live up to. You know, you have to accept and then live up to them. Do you think that's true of Buddhism as well? Um, no, because <laughs> I wouldn't. Uh, no, because. Um, the Buddha, the Buddha says, this is the way I found. Follow it if, if you find it helpful. If not, find your own way. Yeah. So yeah. It, there isn't an imposed mm. thing. Um, but most religions, Abrahamic religions, actually tell you, this is it. You believe yes. it, or otherwise you're an infidel. Yes, yeah. I mean, Cupid is challenging that, I suppose. Yeah. Challenging it's that definition of religion. The, the phrase, beliefless religion, is a contradiction. Yeah, yeah, but maybe because you're you're stuck with a particular yeah. idea of what religion. It might be. Yes. Is it how it it's might defined. Be, but religion is to do with rituals and, and things that mm. Phil was mentioning now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think I think perhaps belief in the supernatural. If, yes. if If he'd gone on to expand belief in supernatural um, religions, then then I think I mean you know as you pointed out, uh, you know you can have you can be a religious fanatic about football. <laughs> so yes. too, you yes. can be a religious fanatic about the way to lead a good life without any recourse to supernatural elements. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I suspect, again, that's Anne de Botan's point. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I, I, yeah. I just briefly like to point, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I'd just briefly like to point out that we're, we're here in the Friends Meeting House, which is, of course, uh, run by the Society of Friends, the Quakers. Yes. And the Quakers, of course, don't actually have a creed. Uh, you, know, mm. you don't have to yeah. subscribe to any particular belief system, and yet most people would think of it as a religion. Yes. Yeah. John? I was going to say, I didn't see the theme sort of living authentically, which seemed a pretty good description mm. to me. Yeah. But a lot of people that write these books and that, like Don Cupid, I mean, they probably really do want to live life to the full. But I don't know if everybody does, to tell you the truth. So I think they might have want an easier time than that, and just sort of muddle along a bit. That's and okay. When you said, yeah. um, when you said you, know, you thought you didn't know whether it was a lonely person or not, but I think the more you think about these things, like Sartre and de Beauvoir and all that, the more you realise how much on your own you are. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a funny thing. Mm. That mm, yeah. They become so aware of the existential aloneness. Yes. Um, it, it yes. sort of gets really sharp. Yeah, yeah. It's very friendly with insects, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he does mention authenticity in, in his books. Um, yeah. I just didn't have room for that particular word. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, David. Well, uh, I just follow up on your point of insects. I was uh, shifting my compost seat yesterday and uh, <laughs> moved a lot of nice red worms. I mean, yes. that is life, and they and me are just part of one and the same continuum. Yes. And if they didn't exist, the detritivores, none of us would exist because we'd be 90 feet deep in dead plants yes. and yes. things. So we're all yes. part of one continuum, A, yes. as human beings, yeah. and also with all these other. And the very bacteria that support my life, yeah. if I cease to breathe within an hour, they'd be consuming me because yeah. they say, well, he stopped, I'll just eat him up. You know? yeah. So, I mean, I only exist yeah. because of something Other life forms. rushing around inside yeah. me, E. coli and yeah. whatever. Yeah. I've not you heard know, that I'm word. just a big machine for carrying all this rubbish about, you know. I've not heard that word, detritum. <laughs> Detritivores? Detri I, just, I used to have biologists who worked for me. Oh, Detritivores right. are like beetles and things that eat yes. uh, worms. Eat yeah. They turn badness into goodness. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed that. Um, yes, and then we'll come back to you. <laughs> just, uh, well, not read any of Don Cupid's books, so perhaps I shouldn't say anything. That's right. <laughs> You've read 30 of the books. Yes. Fantastic <laughs> the, uh, my, my comment would be, um, with religion of life, isn't it? To what extent? I can see how it made it life difficult for Don Cupid, but I wonder if we take, you know, people you know, throughout civilization, to what extent people who have religious beliefs don't embrace the religion of life to just the same extent. And I would certainly say I do, 
and many people that I know do. Yes. So it depends where you are in that particular spectrum of I think, yeah, I think I'd probably make two points about that. Don Cuba would say that serious religion, and, um, you know, he'd probably, he'd probably have to go back several centuries, you know, for serious religion to, to be you know, a common, common experience. I think he would say that people's um, perception was that, you know, life, life is, a, is a preparation for the next life, and therefore there was, you know, the, the, the life experience was compromised here, you could say, because they actually thought, I mean, I, I certainly felt that as a, when, when I was a very staunch Christian. I felt that, that, that this life was kind of quite monochrome and dull because I had this idea in my head that heaven was going to be so fantastic that that was what I was really waiting for. And I think that's what, probably what Don Cupid is, is talking about. But I think also increasingly I do come across Christians who say, yeah, I live life to the full just the same way as the humanists do. And I'm thinking, well, you're nearly a humanist in that case. You know? <laughs> I'm not quite sure that you're really being serious about this, you know, this life after death business if you're living life just as much to the full as I am. I would, I would object to that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go on. I can see no point in not living, li living life to the full now. Yeah, okay. Like I can, no point at all. I mean, yeah. you, I mean, what's to be gained by sort of shuffling down, you know, taking it easy? Taking yeah, it yeah. Okay, uh, okay. Fair enough. I'll take that challenge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think Aaron's been waiting yeah. for a while. Aaron. Uh, 250 books, was it? You, you'd think he doesn't um, get out to see life at all? No, about, about 40. About, about 40, 40, okay. Yeah. I got that. Um, yeah, beliefless religion. I was just wondering if Star Trek fell into that category based on my talk last time. Um, if football falls yeah. into it, I thought. Well, yeah, I, th yeah. I think Star Trek is a, is a good candidate for something like that. Yeah, yeah I think we have to call that a cult. Humanist cult. Yes, Elaine. Um, really, a little bit like the gentleman along there said. Um, this thing about the great sun and you're living your life to the full and you're full of enthusiasm and energy. Yes. I can't relate to that. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my 70s now and I just haven't got the energy anyway. Um, have you, did you have the energy in previous decades? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, you know, I've worked with people in a therapeutic way all of my life and... Um, <clears throat> You know, in life you go through these periods of being very happy and enthusiastic and full of energy and times when you're really down in despair, sadness, mm. loss, mm. whatever. And that's real. Yeah. It's, it's not all a great sun. It's a mixture. I mean, it did make some references that you quoted on there, Cupid, yeah. to some of these times. But I think he was overemphasising the thing that if you're doing it properly, this belief in life, living your life, mm. it's mm. going to be all golden. Mm. And for some people, it's the very opposite of golden all their lives. Yeah, yeah. And it's not their fault. Yeah. I can see how, how yeah, his mm. emphasis on that could, could be taken as a bit unbalanced. Yeah. He doesn't talk a lot about sort of psychotherapy in his books. Um, and obviously that is necessary for many people. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Not um, not just so, psychotherapy, though. I mean, well, I think you're you're also possibly thinking about um, um, you know events that that happen to you. I mean, you if you're born into a very poor, deprived yeah. circumstances, yeah. or um, or into a, a war situation, or um, you know, or you suffer from a degenerative disease. There are all sorts of things that can be imposed on you that make it difficult. To live your life in, the, uh, um, yes. in that sort of way. But, that, but Cooper is saying, you know, life is a package deal. It comes as it comes and you make the most of it. You know, he's not saying, yeah, oh, I... everyone's going to live this perfect mm -hmm. life. You know, he's not saying that. But, you know, make the absolute most of it. Yes. But, you know, it's a bit difficult to make the uh, most of life when you're in a concentration camp. So, so um, well, some ways. Some, some, some ways. Some book on that is, is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yes. Yeah, I was um, 
I've, I've recently come down to Bournemouth, and um, I find that um, in the last several years, I've kind of um, had a change. Lots of people do, and you know, as probably most people in this room, they kind of want to see themselves as someone's living life to the full. Mm. And um, I have a roommate, a very dear friend of mine, we met actually on travels. She said, no, come and stay with me for a couple days, you know, a couple months, see what you think about Bournemouth. And what I find is she, and it's the way she makes the most of life is mm. this busyness that I've never seen in my life. And it's almost like it's a virtue. And I think that this has kind of happened in society as things have kind of ramped up in the last, I would say in the last 15 years, you know, that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. um, and the sense of busyness, which is that's their purpose. And if you're not busy, regardless of what the task is, um, perhaps you're not living life to the fullest. And that's not how I interpret my life and how I want to. Mm -hmm. And although mm -hmm. she means well, I typically will get a lot of, oh, you know, you should be doing this and doing that. And I think, well, hold on. I kind of know what I'm doing, and I feel pretty full about what I'm doing with my life yeah, and, and, yeah. and the intention in which I live it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, again, I'm not at all familiar with Cupid, and I really enjoyed this, because now I can have some books to go back to and have a look. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to me, this is what hit me, was the idea of busyness, as opposed to, not, perhaps not opposed to, but busyness, and then also the notion of living life with intention, yeah. and how that might... Uh, I don't think they have to be um, opposed at all, mm, but mm. I do find that sometimes there's a tension there, and I'm experiencing that now. So. Yes, yeah, um, and just remember that, I mean, you know, we quoted Virginia Woolf, and she's just talking mm. about enjoying just being in Regent's Park mm. in the sun. I mean, that can, that can be it, yeah, you know, it doesn't have to be any busier than that. <laughs> Virginia Woolf didn't have any, she didn't have to work in the mill and slave from 12 hours well, a day because she was a sure, part of a privileged sure, okay. class. Yeah, 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 I know. It's, uh, mm. Can you live life to the full in a, in, if you're in a job that's absolute drudgery? Well, yeah, that's a, a challenge. Gary? I tend to consider one's own temperament and their own character. And at night, how much control we actually have over our life when food is the equation of freedom and eternity. And random fatalistic events. We walk out of the door and there can be events. We have no control over them whatsoever. It's totally random events. Yeah. So uh, I'm not a total fatalist, but I feel that uh, on an individual level, how much control do I actually have about events? about anything really. Mm. I think I'm not going to be the illusion that I've got control. I'm not so sure. Yeah. And also it's temperament and character. Some people are by nature extrovert, outgoing, full of joie de vivre. Other people are more inward. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's fine. I, yeah, I don't I don't think it, it may may be misleading in a way, you know, to talk about this image of the sun. I mean, I, I don't think Cupid is saying necessarily we have to be all extroverts. Uh, and to come back to the point about you know random events, yeah, he's saying that in this religion of life, you know, that that's the, you know, we have to live with with contingency. He is the word that he uses: chance, chance happenings. Um, and he's constantly emphasising, make the most of life while you can, you know, sure. don't waste time. <laughs> How are we doing, Phil? We, we got a, a few more questions, if there yep. are, for yeah, another okay. five minutes okay. will be fine. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think about uh, the, the use of religion that is based on, on a belief is historically, and, and you could argue, you know, for arguing about a belief as religion also having value um, to individuals, but hopefully society as well. I was trying to think, no, no, what, no, what is the function of, of religion? It is, it is partly about identity and community um, mm. and, and purpose and the installation of hope, um, particularly when we've heard stories of people who, who don't have the opportunity to live life to the full really because they live lives of very little hope uh, because of uh, an accident of birth as to where you know, that may be. Mm. But I suppose uh, it, it, for, you know, for me, in thinking about its value to young children, um, it, again, it, it's, it's, it's identity, purpose, and a set of values that are necessary for our society to function. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, for me, isn't about the actual, the, the central tenet about the resurrection, which is one of the things that Cupid obviously got into trouble about. I don't believe in resurrection. I question the resurrection, which is the <coughs> core of Christianity. But, but the value of it is, it, it, it's, it's been the basis of most of our laws about you know, tolerance and forgiveness. And, 
and, uh, and acceptance. And you could argue that religion uh, spurred democracy in many respects. And, and without it, our societies wouldn't function. It would be anarchy. And, and I know, although we know the religion has been used horrendously, inappropriately, um, but when used appropriately, it, it has enabled our society to exist. I'm not saying uh, that, that you actually need the central belief for that. We need the structure of religion, the teachings, the principles of religion to make society function well, and for identity, and for young people and, and, and individuals how our identity. Okay, okay. And, and, and have, to, to understand the principle of altruism, because Listening to the quotes you were giving me of Cupid, they all seem quite selfish, <coughs> and uh, that was the concern. Uh, um, yeah. Although within it, you did talk about general, uh, one of the words was generosity. Yeah. And I hope within his teachings, he talked about the principle of shared joy. Yes. And, yeah, very and much. how important that is to a mm. society mm. in making sure that it's equitable and possible, uh, and, and you know, to try and bridge divides. And, and, and that's what religion has traditionally done when used appropriately. Okay, so or whether or not I, I need the central belief is question. So I gather you're you're speaking as a Christian, are you? Uh, no, as an agnostic. As an agnostic, as an agnostic. okay. okay. Agnostic, you go to a Catholic church. No, it right. sounded to say you. Were, <laughs> <laughs> it sounded to say you that was quite a a, a big sort of defence of, of traditional religion. Well, um, well, but well, I mean, I, 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 all, I, all I would say is that well, just what, what I think necessary. Cupid, yeah. would, what Cupid would argue, mm. is that whatever justifications or, or, or you know, um, words or justifications you would come up for traditional religion, um, he would say yes, it, you know, it was designed to, to, to provide consolation for people and all the rest of it. But in all of his books he says it's in terminal decline, it's in terminal collapse, and that fundamentalism is the, the, the kind of death throes of religion. So whatever you say about it, however you defend it, he's, his claim is that it's finished. Um, oh, I, wondered, just, I, <laughs> I wondered about you, that, that, um, that exact point of it, that when he says it's in terminal decline, is he, is he setting up a straw man of a particular kind of religion that's in terminal decline, namely Anglicanism, possibly? Or is he, uh, I mean, if you look wider in the world, he's only really talking about England and possibly Western Europe. Uh, I think well, if you if you if you were to look at the numbers of people that espouse religion yeah. worldwide, and 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 coming back to Mike's point, a lot of them would not have a negative, this sort of oppressive negative view of of um, the effect of religion on their life. They'd be a bit superstitious about about um, where their luck was coming from or what they should yeah. be doing, but they yeah. wouldn't be. Um, putting everything into the idea that they're going to have some glorious heaven if, if things went badly for them. They would... I don't know, we'd have to ask them, but... Uh, but, I mean, on the bigger question of whether, you know, traditional religion is in terminal decline, that, you'd obviously have to, to look at the statistics and see what, you know, what is happening in different areas of the world with different religions and all the rest of it. Um, but he, he's arguing that, you know, that as a kind of general... Um, observation. That's his claim, but he doesn't. He doesn't say that this is the research to prove my mm. belief. I'd also instead the question that whether things like democracy and so on are based on. Well, clearly, they're not based on Christianity because it predates Christianity. Yes, I'm not saying it's about Christianity. But, no, no, no. But, 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 um, yes. but the, 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 probably uh, it was a religion at the time that uh, no belief in a, in a system of gods that enabled that that society to survive and manage. Mm. And then, uh, and then, you know, uh, and the teachings within that religion. Uh, but again, I don't know. I don't know enough about the Greek religion, the ancient Greeks. But um, may have may have provided that principle of equity and and the voice of the individual, and and, and, and try and uh, and uh, from that. Uh, yeah, keep keep it does. He I does. It's, it's, it's a bit of a wild leap, but, 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 mm. but I'm suggesting that there's a lot of the tolerance and the laws that are fundamental to our society have come. Mm. Uh, through he does acknowledge say, that. He, but again, you could, do, you could do that potentially without the core belief. I'm talking about the structure of, of religion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not necessarily the core belief. Yeah. For me, it matters not whether or not you believe that Christ was the Son of God. Um, okay, okay. It's, it's but it's difficult to maintain a structure if, you know, once the belief is gone, you know, would people keep a structure going? That's, that's kind of what he's saying. I'd, I'd go a little bit further back than that and, and re refer to the book that I talked about a few months ago, which was 
Jonathan Haidt and the and, and the Righteous Mind and and his idea and several other writers as well about about the evolution of religion at a much earlier stage as a valuable um, glue for small societies to make them feel that they've got an identity and to and to set up moral codes so that people that aren't related to each other can live together and function in a society together and trust each other and and have a have some way of knowing what the other people are going to do rather than um, relying on on animal evolution which would just say you favoured your kin. So so I, we did talk about that a bit and I got flack from the very various directions. But um, but that's that's well, another that angle on it. It goes further back than ancient that's about protecting the truth in a primate yeah. rather than rather than your immediate genetic family. I mean yeah. as you could say argue that your genes are in the entire truth, but better they're not, you know, because it's the yeah. periphery of the truth. But 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 that is the broader principle of altruism and that doesn't it's required for our society to manage, you know, to function. Uh, 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 and a lot of that did come out of religion. I'm not saying you know, that that is the same as saying that Jesus was the Son of God. It's not the I same thing at all. I, I, I wouldn't but, say but, that, that it came out of religion. I would say I would say that in in earlier societies, religion was one of the mechanisms by which that promulgated. Yeah. 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 But it, I think we're going to have to. Um, sorry, go on, Elaine. No. Um, well. Carrying on this theme, really, I mean, it has. I have wondered in the last few years now that more of us are rejecting any of the traditional religions apart from perhaps a sort of half interest in Buddhism and, and the things that Buddhism teaches, is what's going to happen to the society, the, the community, small and large? And, you know, where are young people going to get their ideas of how to live a meaningful life, both as individuals and as members of society? And it, it must be very hard for them. And I mean, it does worry me it's how young people are really living very meaningless and destructive lives in many ways. More, I think, than was so in previous generations, maybe. I don't know if that's true, but anyway, I mean, they've got all the things good going for them, certainly in the West, and yet they're still messing it up for themselves and for other people in many ways. And um, so what happens, and I think people, many people will follow anything that's going, you know, they, they seem to catch on to these isms and leadership and charisma and so on. And in many ways, pop music, and you know, some of it's quite destructive, really. Okay, um, I'll, I'll just make a couple of a couple of points. I don't really share your pessimism about young no. people in general. And Cupid would say, um, morality can look after itself. It doesn't need an institutional well, church to teach it. Well, I don't necessarily agree. I think it needs a structure, and we haven't got one. Instead, well, is what I'm supposed to humanist say. group is here, we're, we're yeah. doing our best. <laughs> and, and we'll yeah. carry on with our next session, which may convince you otherwise. Yeah. So, um, thank you.